morning, everyone, and welcome to the panel on female beauty, its pleasures and pains. We'll all briefly introduce ourselves before we get started. I'm Tracy from um, the University of Auckland in New Zealand, coming to you at eight o'clock in the morning from my garage. <laughs> Hi, um, I am Lynn Wood Mollenauer. I'm at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where it is 4 p.m. I'm actually in Wilmington and not in Paris, despite my background. It's just a lot neater than my messy office. Uh, and uh, I'll be speaking about my paper today. My paper today uh, was entitled Golden Youth, the Lore Potable and the Quest for Youth and Beauty in the Ancien Regime. It's part of a larger project that I've embarked on in the circulation and transmission of medical knowledge and practice in the early modern period. I'm Christine Adams. I am a professor of history at St. Mary's College of Maryland. I'm coming to you from my basement in Alexandria at the moment. Um, same time in the same time zone as Lynn, four o'clock in the afternoon. And my paper today is called Navigating the Pleasures of Paris After the Terror, the Meve used through the eyes of Louis Sebastien Mercier. And this is part of a larger project that I've just started working on on the Meve use and both their, their life and their afterlife, um, sort of, and, and I wanted to start by looking through the eyes of Mercier since he was one of the first people to, to write about them and sort of impose a collective identity on them. Um, hi, I'm Emmanuelle Roth. I'm a PhD student at Durham University in the UK, but I'm currently in London in my flat. And it's 9 p.m. here, um, so yeah, evening time. And yeah, my PhD is uh, called sex, song and self-fashioning women on the popular Parisian stage and I'm looking at um, yeah, female actors from the popular Parisian theatres in sort of the first, the second quarter of the 19th century and thinking about um, celebrity and also intersections with um, historical associations with um, sex workers um, and quarter stands. So yeah, that's me. Okay, well I'll get the, get the discussion kicked off. Um, uh, my paper was on Anne Boleyn, and uh, she doesn't actually fit into my current project, except sort of tangentially. My current project, following on um, a book that I've just finished with, with Chris, who is sitting here right beside me, virtually, on, on the French royal mistresses. I'm now looking at Agnès Sorel, and I'm writing a book entirely on her. And Agnès, as a celebrity, she wasn't a celebrity during her own lifetime, for all of the reasons that, um, that, 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 that the Fry sisters papers could explain ritualistically, um, you just don't have the same sort of thing as you do as, as a, a celebrity in the modern era. But nonetheless, she becomes a posthumous celebrity. She's a celebrity this very day, um, very popular on, on Instagram, for example. She has dozens of Instagram sites. So the idea of the posthumous celebrity. Um, and that's why I'll just start with this question, um, throwing it out in response to Emanuela's paper on celebrity as something that is embodied. Um, I'm, I was very curious about that because I've always thought of celebrity as something that is completely not embodied. It's something that I associate with an image or a celluloid image or, or a painting. So I'll just throw that out. What does it mean that celebrity is embodied or not embodied? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I, I guess I'll pick up given that you mentioned my paper. Um, yeah, I, I was really interested, obviously my period is a time before photography and before filming um, both audio and visual. And so I think often, especially currently celebrities, obviously we've got, as you say, social media, we've got all these very easy visual access um, and just constant imagery. And so that is very much the fabric of celebrity and it has been over the centuries as well of course there's lots of other type of imagery before photography but I think as a as a trying to recapture the kind of theatrical world um I think it's important not to overlook the the kind of live performance and the lived experience especially at a time you know before cinema or whatever um and so yeah I, I was interested in kind of um, various theories that I mentioned in my talk um, about trying to kind of reintegrate that imagery and the kind of reputation beyond the kind of real material body um, with that sort of more yeah materialist feminist sort of discourse um, and so yeah um, it's something that I think is, is relevant today as well but I think certainly 
earlier in, in history when, when there's fewer um, opportunities for image circulation. I think it's even more important as we try to kind of rehabilitate um, past sort of celebrities and female celebrities in particular in terms of bodies and physicality. Um, yeah, I don't know if someone else wants to. Yeah, I'll jump in here because, I mean, in a way the Mavi is as well are celebrities in their time. I mean, they start to show up in the newspapers as they emerge on the social scene in, in 1796, 1797. And, you know, one of the things that you get from Massier's account are these very, you know, physical descriptions of them as they sort of move through the social space. They're out there dancing, they're out there. I mean, he, he has this very detailed scene of them eating, you know, and how how they're able to eat with more pleasure because they don't have corsets on. And so they, they take advantage of the sort of looser styles to, to cram food into their bodies at a time when other people are, are starving to death. But, 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 you know, the descriptions of them and their celebrity is such a physical thing because people are presumably seeing them on the streets. They're seeing them dancing. They're seeing them go off in their, their carriages. And that's what creates this imagery about them because presumably you know, not everybody's reading about them in the newspapers. I mean, there's this this sort of, um, uh, you know, people are, are, are going off to see them. So, so I really like that idea of celebrity as something that is embodied. And what I'm interested in working on too is, you know, trying to compare what is said about them at the time by contemporaries, as opposed to how they are portrayed by later writers in the, the 19th and 20th century, who I think are, are really responsible for, for a lot of the damage done to women <laughs> um, up to the present day, who have just completely distorted the historical record in so many important ways. But, but I am really sort of curious as to, to seeing how that, that works as you translate from people who physically saw these women and, and, and wrote about them, as opposed to how um, writers make use of them later. So. What, what I was really struck by, Chris, uh, reading your paper is, and I, I just I, I jotted down, I, I was they, they're a counterpart to Lilti's invention of celebrity in that they're mm -hmm. anonymous, right? His okay. work really discusses um, actors, right, who in embodying a role, right, are seen as a fusion of both character and, you know, um, and historical person like live person but it was it's it's really it's fascinating to think about this group of women who are not for the most part we don't know who they are but for right. a few and right. who can it seems to me also move in and out of that space as celebrities because it's actively a role and it and it's is taken on in a social space right, right. with others and one can step out of it too, right? Yeah. And so that anonymity seems like it's, it's a real transitional moment for this idea about how celebrity evolves. It, it, it is really, I mean, that is a really interesting point. And that's, I mean, the fact that they are so anonymous in Mercier's account and actually in the newspapers as well. I mean, there's certain, certain women who show up, like, like Madame Talion shows up by name. Mm -hmm. Um, before she's ever sort of associated with the Merveilleuse. I mean, it is this sort of construction that is, that is imposed on them. And you're right. It's not clear to me how one becomes part of the group. Is it that someone decides that you are, or do these women identify themselves somehow with this group? And, and, and how do they move in and out of that space? And so I don't know yet <laughs> because I'm yeah. you know, starting to work on it, but I, I, it's a really interesting way of thinking about it. So, so. I picture them as like mean girls, but you know, so it's like all, all these them, movies. Yeah. I think that a lot of them are. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're apparently like some of them are sort of stupid and coarse. I mean, you find accounts in the newspaper kind of making fun of them and Mercier suggests that as well. But, but in fact, the individuals are not because the individuals whose names we know of, like Juliette Racanier or Madame Talion are actually, you know, pretty savvy and, and smart and, and, and cultured. And so it's just, um, yeah, so I'll be really interested in, in making those connections. So anyway, but, um, but, but you, you, Lynn and, and Tracy are both working on women who also are sort of reconstructed, I mean, by, by future historians. And it's sort of once again, sort of trying to, to mm -hmm. figure out Anne, or Anne Boleyn in her context, and then how she especially is written about by 19th and 20th century people who impose this completely other, or, new identity on her and, and mm -hmm. young as well. 
I, I think it, that she's um, very much in keeping with Agnès Sorel and, 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 and Bolin in that she's, uh, she's uh, de deconstructed and reconstructed all the time, both during her lifetime and after, as the, the puzzle is how does she acquire, attain, and maintain power. And it, uh, it makes me think of the ways in which descriptions of beauty are not about the physical, right? A, a physical description, but r rather about the social effect of beauty. Uh, and what we seem to be circling around always is that, is that social effect, right? Um, and if, uh, for instance, I was, as I was writing this paper, going back to read the uh, Princess de Cleve, because that's one of the first places in which Dion de Poitiers shows up as a character, uh, but neither she nor any of the other women at court are described in any other way, but simply as beautiful, right? There's no physical description of what they looked like. That doesn't particularly matter. It's their impact um, on the people around them. Um, could I take this in just sort of a, a slightly different direction to bring, bring it back to the idea of embodiment and celebrity? Um, uh, the, my, my project at the moment is, is Anya Sorel, and so of course I'm interested in the image of her that, um, whether it is her or not, and I think it actually is, I won't go into the reasons, but, but um, why that image has been so long lasting, and I, I'm arguing that she is actually the first female celebrity, the first professional beauty of mm. France. And so in terms of embodiment, the thing that I find so interesting in that, that, that uh, the lactating virgin is that you have to imagine a spectator of the 15th century receiving that image in the context of medieval, um, medieval theater, so, so a medieval religious theater. So at that time, you would imagine your neighbor playing Jesus Christ as two very different persons. I mean, the, the way you imagine um, theater in the Middle Ages is that you've got a, a persona, you've got the, the You've got the human being who you know, a person that you deal with that all the time, and then Jesus Christ, a person that you obviously don't know. And there isn't any any sort of, I don't know, um, there isn't any um, sense of, of a horrible discrepancy there because of the idea of persona, which is a completely different way from our imagining celebrity today, which is a, a fusion of the, the person and the, the role that they play. And it seems to me that this is the way that Agnès Sorel becomes a celebrity at all. It's because of this image, which is really only possible up through maybe the, the end of the 15th century. And then, then the 16th century court, the royal court gets that image and they do a very different thing with it. They put her into the, the, into the sort of the, 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 the category of mistress. And, and by that time, that category exists. So, so that's okay. Um, so anyway, the fusion of the human being and the role, it seems to me is, precisely not how Anya Sorel becomes a celebrity. And if anyone wants to talk about that, um, I would love to hear, hear your feedback. So, so that she, when you say she is not fused, that, 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 that she just exists in some other category or doesn't have a yeah. category? What I'm, what I'm thinking is that she would have been received in the same way that um, any figure in a medieval religious play would have been received which is the, 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 the a person watching a church play doesn't have a sense of, of blasphemy because in the, you're, you're not imagining in any case that there's a fusion between the person, the human being, and the role they're playing. Something like an icon. You look at the Virgin Mary's statue and you're, you're praying through the statue. The Virgin Mary isn't in the statue. Her archetype is somewhere beyond the statue, but she gives you access to the real Virgin Mary. And in the same way, figures in medieval theater at least this is what, what, what the people who theorize on how medieval theater works say. The idea is that, that the, the, the person, the, 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 the entity to whom you are praying is far beyond the physical person who is giving you access to that person. So in, in this way, then Agnes Sorel, her features would have given you access to the Virgin Mary, but there's no sense of blasphemy looking at that painting because she's not there to say, I'm the Virgin Mary. She's Agnes Sorel and the Virgin Mary is somewhere beyond and you get to that that um, to the Virgin through those through those features. There isn't any fusion of Agnes and the Virgin. Does that make any sense? Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and then, because your, your, your actresses yeah. are very different <laughs> by the time. Yeah. I was going to say it's, um, I didn't want to sort of interrupt if you were going to say something, I was just going to say it's so funny because um, actually I've been think, looking a little bit at Anya Sorel because you're probably familiar with the, there's a very famous play about her at the start of the 19th century. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and although it's a little bit earlier than my period, I'm definitely looking at it because actually in future vaudeville, some of the music from that gets referenced in future. No. Yeah, and we can talk about it and we can geek yeah, out about it at a later date. But um, really? I'm, kind of, I'm looking at the incorporation of historical courtesans being played on the stage. And so I'm looking at Marion Delorme as well, and Madame Pompadour and Dubarry. And oh, Anya Solnel is, is sort of one of the first um, yeah. examples for me. So it's really interesting that you've kind of identified her as the first female French celebrity. Um, but yeah, I've actually been, because obviously in the 19th century, female actors get called Daughters of Eve. Um, and so in, in a sort of religious context, they're very much seen as, as kind of yeah, Eve as the temptress and the kind of, um, uh, not just temptress, but also the, the sort of the, the liar or the sort of deceitful one. And, and this, is, this is both from a sense of like playing a part. So, you know, feigning an emotion or feigning a part, but also kind of the association of easy morals of theatre women. So this kind of double association with sort of um, mistresses. And I've been thinking about actually from a sort of corporeal and Catholic, you know, thinking about Daughters of Eve and this kind of very um, 19th century, very moralistic, which you you, you mentioned in your Mer Merveilleur's um, paper about this kind of uh, freedom, which then obviously later when Napoleon comes, it all kind of gets restricted again right. with the Napoleonic Code. So I'm kind of looking at the period after that where um, you know, they're trying to kind of make, they're trying to maybe have a sense of um, honour or a sort of public reputation and in some ways trying to fight with that. Um, but I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is I'm thinking about this, the place of the body on stage and the incorporation of previous characters mm -hmm. and often like maybe honourable or dishonourable women from the past and how they might use their own bodies either to sort of, in a kind of, almost religious type reincarnation how they might be seen as trying to almost redeem themselves mm -hmm. um so the play of marion de Lorme, she she gets she gets compared to um when she's repentant and i'm seeing her as a bit of a figure prior to the sort of um um dame or camellia in the middle of the century the kind of the um, repentant courtesan par excellence but marion de Lorme gets described as a kind of mary magdalene um weeping at the feet of Jesus um, and so yeah I've been thinking a lot about how through the body women might through the performing body how they might try and sort of redeem themselves or this idea of kind of the sinful flesh mm -hmm. so I think it's interesting what you're saying about in medieval theatre there's this very clear-cut divide between the icon and the kind of reference to it but definitely separate entities mm -hmm. whereas by the 19th century there's very little differentiation in fact they're constantly getting confused the roles mm -hmm. especially women and I'm interested in why is it that women seem to be less able to escape their their role maybe more than men might you know often in reviews women will get called by their, their role part whereas men will maybe get called by their actual um, real life name so yeah I, I think yeah it's a very interesting point where where along that line does that, mm. that that line get blurred into kind of image and body um, yeah you, you know something that I from your your presentation that I found really interesting about you that and that links to to what Lynn was talking about was the fact that um, Madison Mars was was 19 years older than than yeah. Uh, yeah. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. is playing these these young women on the mm -hmm. stage in her 50s, and you know it, and that's not uncommon, I guess, in theater. I mean, the the Hamilton is coming coming to to um, our screen soon, but but the woman who played. Um, Oh, this one of the Schuyler sisters, the oldest Schuyler sisters, I think is is in her 40s or 50s. Mm. And, you know, that we, there's, and I don't know if it's just that we don't notice their age when they're, they're actresses or, 
because we there is this sort of celebration of youth i mean that goes mm -hmm. way back i mean of women's youth and yet it does seem in theater that these women and sarah bernhardt right doesn't she keep acting until she's quite old too and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and with no mm -hmm. cognitive dissidence that you have these these older actresses um despite our horror of aging <laughs> and so, yeah 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 i and uh I, I was thinking the same. Uh, there's a there's a parallel now. If you've uh, you know watch about any movie, there'll be wild discrepancies between the age of the actors and the role in which they've taken on. But there does seem to be this space in which the actor can play that role and is given a um, uh, leeway to to do so. Right? It's a kind of collective. Uh, Amnesia. <laughs> and uh, amnesia, it's, uh, there's an expression that is not springing to mind. Um, uh, that's the Suspension expectation of, of the audience. Oh, sorry. Suspension oh. of disbelief, maybe. <laughs> that's a willing to that. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, right, that's what the audience uh, offers, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's this idea of performance, too, and what the audience accepts as the performance, I think. Um, and the, also the requirements of various types of performance, right? In, in some ways, we're tracing how that changes over time. If we go back to thinking about Agnes Sorel, too, where, uh, and it's different. I was thinking about the, the, how the court is so very um, different, uh, you know, with the, the court of Charles VII as compared to Louis XIV uh, oh, yeah. or, or after, right? And it's that idea of the court as a stage in and of itself mm -hmm. is not the case yet, right? It just doesn't have that same kind of um, yeah. uh, performative quality. I don't think it does, but... Um, no, no. Yeah. Lynn, could I ask you a, a quick question? I'm just really curious about what, what you make yeah. out of the discrepancy. I mean, I'm thinking of, of ambassadors who see Diane de Poitiers and go, my God, yeah. she's ancient. You know, what, is, what are they talking about? And then her reputation. I mean, do people look at her and see someone who's young and beautiful, do you think? Or are they, are they willingly suspending their disbelief? Or, or what do you think is going on? I, th I think it's I, that, I mean, I, I, um, and I've, I've thought about this too, because I, I read your book. Um, Tracy and Chris uh, write about, you know, comparing the reactions to royal mistresses as well. And I think there is this, uh, one is stepping into a role that one has to meet certain expectations for, right? And so the, the, it's a role created initially by Agnes Sorel and it, and it changes over time. Uh, but those who don't fit this role particularly well are then as soon as they fall, it's because they didn't fit the role properly. If you think about Louise de la Valliere, right, who becomes one of those uh, penitent Magdalene types, and she she fits that role, but she's and she's never, yeah, she she's never beautiful enough or intelligent enough uh, to have the role. As for Diane de Poitiers, the accounts that I've I haven't read a I'm trying to think if I've read any of the ambassador accounts about her, but they. I, I think they they lean on the social impact of her beauty and what it has brought and continues. And she's a she's a marvel, right? And she must be beautiful because the king continues to love her. And so mm -hmm. I think it's almost the imprimatur of the king's um, attentions that assigns that kind of charisma that's read as and described as beauty. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I would put it. Do you, do you think that in the context of the 16th century that it was easier to to be perceived as beautiful because there would have been such a difference between that sort of self-presentation of a woman at the court who would have been drinking her, 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 yeah. her liquid gold and who would have, you know, been wearing the cosmetics and the jewelry and, and you know, presumably she was, her hair was covered and, and you know, that, that there wouldn't have been much of her exposed except for you know, mm -hmm. and would it have been easier to to attribute beauty? Because that's what the Mabeu is. One of the things that they talk about with women like Madame Talion is, oh, well, she can carry off the, the you know, having her, her arms and her breast exposed because she's really beautiful, but it's not really flattering to a lot of women. They'd rather go back to the old style clothing that covers you up and sort of yeah. cinches you into place. And so, 
So I wonder too, if, if people are primed to see someone as beautiful, they see them as beautiful um, because, and because they're, they're clothed in beauty. I, I do think so. It's um, right. And it's also that we're thinking about embodiment too. It's the way that the body uh, is, it exists and moves in, in space and what surrounds it. Uh, clothing isn't particularly form, you know, form fitting. And right. it's, it's not how it's cut so much as the costliness mm -hmm. and the beauty of the fabrics with which it's made. Right. Uh, so dresses are beautiful because they cost, you know, 2,000 farms or whatever they're saying about, uh, you know, Madame de Montespan's uh, uh, cloth of gold dress. Right. Uh, uh, and because of the aura that such rich riches give off, and this seems to be how the merveilleuses are also described, right? They're, they're dripping in diamonds and they have right. toe rings. I was like, yes. toe, <laughs> toe rings in the 19th the century. <laughs> Right, and their bare arms, and they're you know they're revealing, yeah, and and yes, yeah. I mean they're clearly dressed in nines, and so yeah, yeah. I mean I, I just think that's really interesting, and so I mean to to go back to Anne Boleyn, I mean why she wasn't perceived as beautiful by most people, it seems, even though she also would have been presumably dressed as a, a lady of the court, and yet. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a really, I mean, and that they choose, you know, the, the, the sort of focus on her grace is really interesting because, I mean, mm -hmm, once mm -hmm. again, what does that mean precisely? I mean, what are they talking? I mean, was it spazzatura? Did they say grace? I mean, what was the word that they used for her? They use the word grace, yeah. yeah. Grace. Gra gra grace in English, which I take to be the same yeah. word as grace and grazia. Mm -hmm. And as to why people didn't think she was beautiful in her time, I think by this point, I mean, it's been a while since there's been the concept of beauty of face, which um, isn't present as far as I can see. So 13th, 14th century, then you start to see it. I mean, I, the first place I see it is with, with um, Anna Brittany, who's described as beautiful specifically of face and not of body. So I think that huh. Anne Boleyn's face was not considered particularly beautiful, but that's a fairly new concept. And it's only in a very particular context that people say that. These are people who are reporting to other people about exactly what she looks like. So they're trying to be very specific about, about her face. And I would assume that if you grabbed a random person off the street and said, look at this woman and her gorgeous, her, her rustling black satin, that they would say, yes, she's beautiful. I think that it's just a very, very particular sort of situation. And then, then those have been spun into this idea that she's, she's got this sort of sexual allure because she's not very pretty, but she's got that, that sex appeal or whatever in, in the modern era. That's what it seems like. That's uh, certainly they're using uh, cross, you know, into the 17th um, century to describe what is, what is pleasing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's that, um, uh, which is essential uh, to, um, to, on, right to thinking about that that social response to beauty which is meant to be you know both marvelous and pleasing at the same time and it's uh, but and it's it's still this ineffable thing right so um, even when you get those a uh, list of 31 components of beauty uh now that you mention it tracy i did that list uh and it's from one of the one of the conference that uh uh the Renaudot um, put on. It says blue eyes, it says black eyebrows, but that's it. I mean, the rest is, uh, it's all about descriptions of the body, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it, it describes hands, it describes breasts, it describes chest, it describes neck, it describes a couple other things, uh, but it's not, and I don't think it's even um, hair color there too. So blue mm -hmm. eyes. Um, I was wondering, Emanuela, did you, what, how were the actresses on the, on the stage in the 19th century? Are they, do they get sort of assigned beauty by virtue of being on the stage, right? If they're, if they are on the stage, they're therefore beautiful? Um, not always, but um, more and more so throughout the century reviews, or not necessarily reviews, but certainly um, biography, biography um, mm -hmm. 
will focus more and more on their kind of yeah their aesthetical their aesthetics especially women um i think there's a kind of argument that the, the best actors the best female actors would sort of often escape kind of overt focus on their beauty traits because they're kind of taken more seriously um certainly in reviews like in the newspaper whereas maybe in these sort of sub-genres like i mean in my paper i talk about the petite galerie but that's kind of more specifically a visual uh, costume design but there's all these sorts of petite biography um creeping up that are kind of supposedly talking about these actors from a biographical um and sort of you know performance base but yeah more and more the certainly the, the anecdotes about the women will focus on their kind of yeah their, their appearance um but no I don't think it's automatic that to be on stage you have to be beautiful um but I mean I think there's maybe more yeah there's a lot of focus on or maybe the body and kind of certain physical traits um and yeah again a, a kind of association with loose morals and sort of um, sexuality maybe and there's a lot of anecdotes about various liaisons whether they're to be believed or not um and i've i've looked at kind of issues of consent and stuff as well when looking at some of those narratives um because yeah there's kind of a whole hashtag me too movement to be uh, undertaken there um but yeah i think my paper was kind of yeah wanting to move away from maybe uh I think sometimes in the past scholars have kind of wanted to evade the physical um, focus to say, no, no, we need to take these people seriously as actors. So mm -hmm. let's, let's not focus on their physical traits. And, and, you know, I think, you know, that's just, it, that's still a moralistic argument, presuming that a focus on kind of physical and beauty is automatically going to be de denigrating. Um, and so, you know, I think that ties in kind of almost, I guess, a, it comes back to what you're bringing up at the end of your Anne Boleyn paper about sort of, um, you know, there being, there being physicality can be important, but there's clearly yeah other things going on and, and, and valuing them in different ways and not necessarily in a sort of hierarchical, um, yeah, structure. So I guess that sort of that that taking physicality seriously is maybe the thing that does link all of the the papers. You know whether that's you know, physical representations or, you know, how those, how, how what we assign to physicality changes in different mm -hmm. historical time periods and, and, and across time and space. But um, anyway, so I guess we can draw things to a close here. Is there anything that anybody else wanted to add to the discussion or touch on? I only have one and it's a, it's a trivial question, but now I'm very curious and it's a, it's a very small and important question for Tracy. Uh, it's about the Hilary Mantel books. <laughs> uh, do, yeah. do you like her characterization of Anne? Have you read those? The, um, no, bring I, up I the bodies? Like, I, I, as predictably, I don't like her characterization of Anne. <laughs> I love her characterization of Cromwell, <laughs> but, um, but, I, but, but I will say about, about the way she treats Anne, she read her stuff. I mean, the Anne looking over her shoulder as she's going towards the block mm -hmm. that is straight from Carl. I mean, so, so it, she read that she is completely immersed in all of the, the primary sources. So, so good for her, but I would have just given her a slightly different characterization. But, but it's Hilary Mantel, for God's sake. I mean, she, the, the, the books are just compelling. Sorry, on that note, have you seen yeah. the musical Six? Seen what? Oh. Have you seen the musical Six? No, I, everyone keeps telling me about oh. it. And I'm dying to see it. Yeah, I can't it's wait. It's so brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. It's hilarious. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you think of that after. Yeah, wait, wait. When right. lockdown is over, and then yeah. Yeah. travel again. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have the, the afterlives of Anne Boleyn. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. We have to also manage to insert ourselves into popular culture and make use of these these things for, for people to then want to see what what um, the reality is yeah. or the, yeah. the yeah. construction right. of the reality behind their their portrayals. So anyway, well, well, this was great, guys. Yeah, um, thanks to all of you for. I had a great time. I, I got them in the middle of the night, but it was fabulous. Emmanuel, as I had already, but but it was great. It was terrific reading you. <laughs> yeah, um, I enjoyed it all as well. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I wish we could have met in person in uh, yes. Auckland, but um, yes. 
uh, at some point we'll all get there. So yes. Yeah. So, okay. so next time. <laughs> so yeah. Right. Back. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, 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 guys. Bye. bye. bye.